Hey guys, my name is Hiroko Murakami, back with another video with Knowledge Academics. Today we'll be continuing with topic C, specifically C3 Wave Phenomena Part 1. This is part 1 of the series, uh, so let's get right into it, right? So, up until now we've talked about what waves are, what type of waves there are, how sound is made, how, you know, light is also an EM wave as well, right? So, and we've also talked about a lot of the characteristics like frequency, period, wavelength, amplitude, all those stuff, right? Uh, velocity included. There's two more that we haven't talked about, and let me just cover them quickly. They're called wavefront and rays, okay? So what are they? Well, wavefront is defined as a line joining neighboring points in phase. So essentially these points. So if you align them, it makes a wavefront. Specifically in 3D, it's a wavefront plane, okay? So it's just like the face of the wave coming at you, right? And rays are just lines showing the direction of where that's going. So in this case, this is the wavefront. And this is the ray because it's coming at the beach front, right? Uh, in this example, you're going to have like these ripples. These ripples are the wave front. And then where are they going? Well, they're going in every direction, right? So those will be the rays. So one thing I want you to notice is that they're always perpendicular to each other. And also one more thing is that wave front can be connecting the, uh, the crests, like the peak points, or connecting the troughs, which is the bottom point, or the midpoint. It doesn't really matter, but for conventional reasons, I'm just going to say that wavefront is connecting the lines at the peak of the waves, okay? If you don't know what crests or troughs are, then check our previous video for more information on that. Okay, so it looks like this in 2D for parallel rays and spherical like that, okay? And they're always perpendicular. So now that we've concluded the characteristics of waves like frequency, velocity, wavefront, all that stuff, let me talk about what this whole video is about, and it's about wave behavior, what they can do, okay? And they can do a lot of things, including propagating energy, of course, that's a definition of wave, uh, but more specifically, they can reflect, they can bend, and they can spread out, okay? Reflecting, quite simple, right? Sunlight reflects off of the surface of the ocean, and it comes into our eyes, we see the reflection. We see the reflection in our mirrors too, right? In fact, if light could not reflect, we would not be able to see anything. The way I see, let's say, like a tree, right, is light bouncing off of the tree into my eyes. So that's reflection. How about, uh, and that's why we can't see anything at night, right, because there's no light except moonlight. That's why we can see a little bit. It can also bend. So light can also bend, right? So if I stick a pencil inside a cup of water, it looks like it's bent. And that's because of something called refraction. We're going to talk about it more in detail. Last thing it can do is it can spread out, it can diffract. We call it diffraction. This one is going to be a heavy topic. We'll be covering that in the next video. Uh, today we're gonna to be focused on reflection and bending. So let's get right into reflection. Well, reflection, I'm sure you've already covered this in your previous you know, physics where um, high school physics before the IB, uh, the incident ray and the reflector ray, they have the same angle of incidence and angle of reflection. Sorry about the typo here. Um, where are the angles measured from? It's measured from the normal line, okay? What is a normal line? It's the perpendicular line from the surface. And I hope you kind of hear the familiarity because we have normal force. Normal force, the rule of it was it was always perpendicular to the surface. So if I had like a ramp system, the normal force was perpendicular to the surface. Uh, I can even draw from here, perpendicular to the surface. Same thing, normal line perpendicular to the surface and every angle in refraction, reflection, we measure from the normal line. This is really important, okay? Uh, now, one thing, one cool thing we can do with this reflection property is we can concentrate all those sunlight coming in and bounce it off and concentrate it in one spot. What does that do? Well, it heats that place up because all of these sunlights, they have like uh, 320 watts per meter squared, right? If I concentrate all of them, I'm, if I concentrate, let's say two of them, I'm doubling it. If I concentrate like millions of them, then you know what can happen. It can actually ignite and heat up very quickly. So this is actually called a solar furnace, okay? Uh, so it looks like this as a diagram. Okay, well, reflection, it doesn't just have to be light, it can be anything. In fact, sound can reflect off of walls. But how about pulses? So as an example, we've covered this before, right? What is the type of this wave? It's called transverse wave. 
I hope you got that right. It's a transverse wave, right? Uh, sound is a longitudinal wave. Light is an EM wave. We've covered this in the last video. So in this transverse wave, how does it reflect for these kind of pulses? Well, if it's hitting a concrete wall like this, it actually just reflects as we expect it. It just bounces down and comes back, okay? But here's a funny thing. If I attach it to like a hoop where it's flexible or maybe like my arm where it's also flexible, right? Then it actually just whips it back at me. So it actually just, when I whip it like this, it whips it back at me and reflects it like that. So two different, completely different types of reflection that can happen depending on whether this is fixed or loose, okay? Why am I saying this? Because there's a very popular trick question by the IB and paper one multiple choice where they ask you, let's say like less dense to more dense string, how does it reflect? And they have like multiple choice answers. And in this case, you're going from less to more dense. And so more dense string replicates what a concrete heavy wall would do. And so that's why the answer is it reflects back like this. But if I go from a more dense string into a less dense string, then it just whips it back. So it returns it the same way on the same axis. So if I go like this, it reflects it back the same way. Okay, very popular trick question. Now we're done with reflection. There's no math or anything. Reflection is just very straightforward. So we're going to get into refraction. Okay, and refraction is about bending. So we know light can bend or refract when traveling from one medium to another. This does not happen if it's just in the same medium. It happens when it's in different medium. So in this case, we have air and then plastic or glass, whichever you want, and then back into air again. And that's why it bends like that. Same thing with the pencil into a cup of water example I gave you. The light is coming from the air into the water, right? And so that's why it bends, okay? But you might be asking, okay, but how do we know how much it bends? How can we predict how much it bends? Great question. We have a mathematical equation model for that. It's called the Snell's Law, okay? And the entire purpose of the Snell's Law is it predicts the outcome or how much it bends, okay? So as an example, if I have light going from uh, air into water, then I can, I want to know how much it bends, right? And that's what the Snell's Law is for. Now, N here is called the refractive index. It is the benchmark. It is the material property quantity that we give for each material. So for example, air is the base mark, so it's one. Pure water is 1.3, um, diamond is 2.4, etc., etc. right? So we, using this material property, we can predict how much it bends, okay? And also these thetas, where do these thetas come from? Well, we have N1, which is air here, and N2, which is water, because you're going from one to two, right? Theta one is here, and theta two is here. We always measure the angle from the normal, same way as reflection, right? And so how can I find theta two? I isolate it and solve for it, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna give you a quick example. Let's say the light goes from air to water and this place was 30 degrees, okay? Then can you calculate theta two? Well, let me rearrange this equation here. Okay, if I rearranged it, I'm gonna get this, right? Okay, if I were to input all these equa uh, all these uh, numbers, let me just do it here. So theta two is gonna be equal to, I get, 22.6 degrees. So here it's 22.6 degrees, okay? Uh, so these are the types of questions they'll ask you, okay? So let's do a practice problem on the next page. Pause the video and give this one a try. Okay, so we are already given the angle, so incidence is 48. This is 32. Of course, N1 is air and N2 is a plastic, so let's do part A. By the way, don't forget to change your calculator setting to degrees. Uh, funny story, I made a mistake. I kept it as radians and I went into the exam and I didn't check it. Uh, this was a topic test and uh, you can guess what happened, right? So all my final answers are wrong except my work, uh, my method. So 
don't make the same mistake as I did. So check your calculator and yeah, give this one a try. So let's isolate N2. One point four. Okay. Now all the popular uh, mistakes students make is they flip this. They have this the opposite. Just note that n whatever that you find out has to be greater than one. So if you find that n two is lower than one, then you probably did something wrong, and you should redo the question. It's a very easy way to tell whether you did something probably right or wrong. Okay. Part B. Calculate the speed of light in a plastic. So we're gonna use this property v two over v one. So n1 over n2, isolate v2, you should get 2.14 times 10 power of 8 meters per second. Pause the video and give this one a try as well. Okay, so if we already know the velocity, we can probably calculate the uh, refractive index. So n1 over n2 is equal to v2 over v1. We Reorder this. One point three five. Part B. So let's draw this out first so that we don't make any mistake. Angle of incidence of twenty five. This is theta one n1, n2, theta2. So we need to find theta2. So I get 35 degrees. Okay, so I hope you got the same thing. So now I'm going to talk about something called a critical angle, okay? So I'm going to use the example before, but critical angle is an angle at which no light is refracted. Now there's two types of angles that this can happen. One is, well, you have it coming straight at the normal line. So if it comes at normal line, meaning theta one equals zero, then, you know, it's going to come out and not, ref not refract at all, okay? But this is not what critical angle is talking about. Critical angle is where light is not refracted or any wave is not refracted and it's because well if you pay attention into this scenario here so forget about these guys uh, but if you pay attention to this scenario if i increase theta 2 so let's say maybe i do it here then theta 1 is also going to increase right if i keep increasing there comes a point where i can't go anymore like like you know like this is going to be become horizontal now this angle that I just drew here, that's what we call the critical angle. And that's because the refracted light or the refracted wave, it hits this, this uh, horizontal surface. So it doesn't really refract anymore because refraction, there has to be something coming out, right? But if it's not coming out, then it's called internal reflection. It's reflecting within this plane, okay? Now, one misconception that students have is that when you have a refraction going on, there is no reflection at all. And that's actually false. Just remember that there is another ray coming out at theta 2 that's also reflecting. It's only a little bit of it. It's not all of it. So the rest go and refract. Um, but in this case, it is internally reflecting because of this phenomenon called critical angle. Now, it's really important to be able to calculate this critical angle. Okay, so let me just raise all this. So critical angle, I told you, happens when the refract refracted light comes out at 90 degrees. Here, which means it is perpendicular. Okay, so let me just rewrite this. That's theta 1, theta 2. So I'm saying theta 2 is 90 degrees. If I plug this into this expression, sine theta 2, well, sine 90 degrees, that's just equal to 1. So now it becomes n1 over n2 is equal to 1 over sine theta critical. That's what we're trying to find out. If I isolate this theta c, then I get theta c is equal to the inverse n2 over n1. 
okay? So this is what you have to use in order to solve the problem, okay? All the times they're gonna give you the material property and tell you to find the critical angle. So let's do a practice problem. Pause the video and give this one a try, okay? So I'm gonna set water as N1 and air as N2, okay? So N1 over N2 is equal to one over sine theta critical. Okay. Now you might be asking, why did I set water as N1 and air as N2? Because, you know, depending on how I set it, right, then the answer changes, it flips, right? And the answer to this is that the heavier material or the, the one with the higher refractive index always has to be N1 for critical angle. And the reason goes back to the previous example. So let me just do this. So I told you it's the angle uh, it's called the critical angle because at one point it, the refraction goes to this way, right? If I try to do the same thing on this example, let's say I increase the angle, right? Well, it's going to keep refracting. And the reason why is because it refracts towards the normal, whereas this one refracts away from the normal, right? So the critical angle only happens when you're going from a higher refractive index into a lower refractive index, okay? And so that's why when I saw this problem, I was like, okay, water, higher refractive index than air. Okay, and that's why I set that as N1 and N2. Okay, let's do part B. Again, same thing. I'm gonna set glass as N1 and water as N2 because glass is, it has a higher refractive index. So same thing. Fifty-six point two degrees. Now you might be saying, but teacher, I can't really memorize this whole thing where I switch between N1 and N2. Well, you can go ahead and do the opposite, 1.6 divided by 1.33. You're going to always get an error in the calculator. And the reason why is because you can't take the inverse of sine inverse of something greater than one. So if you get uh, error, then just flip it and redo the calculations, okay? All right, we're gonna finish here. Next video, we're gonna start on diffraction. Diffraction is quite a heavy topic, so uh, I hope I'll be able to simplify it for you and solve a lot of different problems. So we'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this kind of video, then consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel. We have a lot more lecture style video and content like this in our channel, so feel free to go check it out. Uh, if you're looking for additional guidance like one-on-one -on -one tutors in IB subjects, SAT, TOK essay, IAs writing, etc., then uh, go to our website at novaedgeacademics.com. Fill out the form and get in touch with us. In the meantime, we'll see you in the next video.